This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. So today on the show, I have Michael Gibbons. Michael runs a firm uh, called Gibbons Trading. He is a market timer, otherwise known as a trend-following trader. He's been at this for a long time. He is somebody who I've had the chance to sit down and have lunch with. He is also a guy who I've looked to put his interesting quotes in my books over the years. He's He's got some... Uh, some very what I what I like to call the classic, not one liners, but the classic kind of parable thing where you read it, and you're like, ah, makes perfect sense. Michael, thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. So listen, let me uh let me jump right in and uh let me let me go to something very basic that I don't think I've discussed uh out of the gate exactly with somebody. Cause I think sometimes it makes good sense to just get right back to the basics. And most of for the United States of America and probably most of the world is predicated on the idea that if you buy a mutual fund and you hold on at some point in the future, Shangri-La will happen and, 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 you know, and unicorns will appear and fairy dust and, <laughs> and, and you'll feel great and life will be wonderful. And, and let's face it, regardless of how much you and I might discuss, discuss things like trend following, the vast majority of market participants are still at a buy and hold mentality. Would that be a fair assessment? Absolutely. So what's, why, don't you, why don't you kind of give uh, a buy and hold critique? Well, the premise of buy and hold uh, is based on essentially backfitting of data. Uh, people looked at data, uh, Jeremy Siegel, for example, and found that if you simply bought stocks going back to, say, even the 1920s and held them, eventually this would be a profitable strategy. But like everything that's backfit, it also left out certain segments of history that were extremely deleterious to your financial health. For example, a whole period from about 1929 to 1939, where people essentially would have lost the vast majority of anything that they had put into a market. Now, I used to be a broker, and I can assure you that when clients have 60 and 70 and even 80% losses in their capital, they will exit. They will pull the plug. They will be gone. So the premise of it all was that people would be disciplined enough to hang on, buy and hold. And at the end, as you said, there will be this big pot of gold. The reality is you're not dealing with automatons. You are dealing with human beings that have emotions. And the fear and greed is always there. And particularly when you see your account drop 80%, for example, uh, the fear factor is there. You pull the plug. You never had the experience of gains. So that would, in, a, in an essence, would be my critique of it. Uh, the other thing that bothers me is that there's a, a built-in premise, that is, that the market always goes up. Uh, it does because of inflation, but you have to adjust those returns if, for inflation. And bonds have actually outperformed stocks using that same logic over the same period of time. So if you're going to argue that it's great to just buy and hold on a comparative basis, it actually would have been better to have bought bonds for that same 80 or 90 year period as opposed to buying stocks. So even if we accept the premise that buy and hold is viable, the fact is bonds outperform stocks for the very test period that the stock advocates use. So from my standpoint, there's a problem with that. Yeah. My, I mean, Michael, you, you mentioned uh, you had a, a broker background. Maybe you could, for some of the audience that, that might not be familiar with, uh, with you or your work, your background, maybe you could kind of uh, go back and illuminate maybe some early starts, how you, how you came to have – some of uh, such uh, wise views of, and frankly, it, it, uh, wise. But I think what I like about the way you look at it, it's very clear. Um, so, how did you how did you get started in, in the markets? Well, I was a econ major in college, and I graduated in 1970. 
And fortunately for me, I had uh, an Austrian professor, Austrian economic school, pretty much the Ron Paul school, if you will. Uh, and I was clear that the doctrines of, of John Maynard Keynes and, and a lot of the others that I was being taught were absolute nonsense. And that at some point in time, people would get back to sound money, gold and silver, whatever. And uh, so I became interested in markets. And my first uh, purchase was uh, gold and silver in the early 70s. And from that, I transformed to starting to trade futures. As most people have the same experience I did, I wasn't very successful at it. Quite frankly, I lost quite a bit of money. Uh, and I realized that I needed to know a lot more about trading than I knew. And at that point, I started to do a whole bunch of research. And, and I believe I was one of the first to really use computers to tear apart uh, trading ideas, specifically oscillators, uh, some trend following ideas from Richard Donchin, all kinds of things. And I found that a lot of the stuff that I thought worked really didn't. And that kind of just increased with time and uh, I became a, uh, a commodity broker and a commodity trading advisor and my experience over the last 52 years of trading is pretty much that I have learned something every year um, as I progressed actually 10 years ago was my transformation into really becoming a trend follower not that I didn't know that trends were effective but there's something about getting the importance of trend following and knowing about it. And I knew about it, but I didn't get it. And when I got it, it changed my life, both psychologically and, and financially, quite frankly. Before you jump into that, let me let me circle back on something that you mentioned mm -hmm. early on, because uh, if people go to your website, you can they can read some of this, uh, some of the, some of your writings, Gibbons trading dot com, G-I-B-B-O-N-S trading dot com. But you mentioned your econ uh, background. You mentioned some of the. Uh, you mentioned Ron Paul, uh, and you you uh, you mentioned Mises. I think you mentioned Mises. Um, but what, from a trend following perspective, while you might share those political and societal uh, ways to view, let's say, the proper organization of life and an economy, and I probably share them right there with you. At the end of the day, those beliefs don't necessarily have anything to do with your trading today, do they? Absolutely. And in fact, in often it often is the case that they're the exact opposite. Uh, I will give you an example. Uh, I know two other professional traders that have really not done well the last five years. And they should know better. But they got into their heads that markets have to go down. They have to go down because we have this terrible debt burden. Uh, we have international issues Social Security and Medicare are, you know, on a financial life support system and these kind of things. And because of it, they were disabled in terms of being able to take a market that was moving and if it was going up, simply buy it and make profit from it. And, and this is why I completely divorce myself from anything I think about markets. In fact, let me just add something here. I go through kind of a, a Zen-like process, for lack of a better term, each morning. I, I actually start trading at 2 a.m. I trade the uh, electronic markets. As soon as I turn my computer on, I literally try to forget everything that I think I know about everything and simply look at the market. Is the market going up? Yes, I need to be long. If the market's going down, I need to be short. It's that simple. I don't look at why because I don't know why. I actually don't know why markets go up. I have no idea why they go down. We have to remove the ought or should and get to the is. And the is is doing what the market is doing right now. Now, obviously, I have a, a method that I use that I've refined over the years, which is a strict, straight, simple trend following method. And if it says I should be long, by God, I'm going to be long. I don't care what I think the fundamentals are. I don't care what news items are bothering the world. Um, people, I never pull the plug if there's some kind of terrible news that comes out. Um, I just don't do that. I absolutely follow my system 100% of the time. And I have two rules of trading. Always trade 
with the system. And the second rule is don't forget the first rule. Mm. Um, it's, it's really that simple. Let me, let me, I'm, I'm going to bounce around here because we've got so much we could talk about. And I, and mm-hmm. it, there's kind of a, I'm I, at the end of this, I think people have a holistic view of a lot of different issues, but we talked a little bit about buy and hold. I wonder if you could actually expand on that some and maybe just for the, for the pretend someone that's listening, maybe they're very successful. Maybe they're a doctor or attorney. Maybe they're a college student. Um, but either way, somebody hears the phrase fundamental analysis. Could you explain the phrase fundamental analysis and then perhaps, you know, explain it and talk about why so many on Wall Street use this, this term and what it means to, to help people to make market decisions? And can you also explain the fallacies with it? Sure. I'd be happy to. As I see it, fundamental analysis, uh, well, it comes from many sources, but primarily the business schools, uh, indoctrinate their business students with this idea that you have to look at price earnings ratios, all these elaborate finance. I mean, I have a background in finance. I've been a controller for corporations, et cetera, uh, at times. And, uh, I, there, you can study all this stuff. But what bothers me is what if the financials are really good and the stock is tanking and it happens all the time? People say, my God, how could that happen? I mean, the company looks so viable. It meets all the criteria. It meets all Buffett's criteria, for example. And the stock is absolutely dropping, just taking everybody's money. And the reality is that fundamental analysis ultimately relies on the market should do something or the stock should do something. That presupposes that people are omniscient, that they know more than the market knows. You see, price is reality. That's what's on the screen right now is real. Some people won't accept that because they don't like it. They don't think that X market should be where it is. Um, I'll give you an example because I'm walking, watching a quote board right now. I started to read all kinds of bearish fundamental stuff about the grain markets about a week ago. And this is after this big run that we've had. All right. I have been long from the very bottom myself uh, in various forms. I've been with options. I've been with futures, et cetera. I still have huge positions on in the grains. All of these fundamental analysts, some that I, I just look at, came out and said, look, it, all this damage, it's all known. But we've had the drought. Corn, everybody knows. Corn, it's, it's baked into the pie. It's baked into the pie. Is it? Uh, corn's had a very large up move, for example, the last two days. Right now, it's up 15 cents again. Uh, soybeans are up 46 cents. Uh, the market is telling me that it, because it's going up, that it isn't done going up yet. How do we know that it, it is going to change trend? Only after the fact. It will simply stop going up. The first thing a market does when it changes trends is to stop doing what it's doing, and then it does the opposite of what it was doing. So fundamental analysis, getting back to that, is always putting your indicators, your concepts on the market rather than allowing the market to do what it does. And so that's the trap. That's my critique of it. I would say that even if a person's been successful with fundamental analysis, over time, they will find that their returns are lessened. And the worst thing that can happen is that you have a tremendous down move in a market. You're long and you have no stop loss. You have no money management strategy, which is often the case with fundamentals. And I would even say that's true of some technical analysis as well, because technicians get into the prediction mode, you know, the targets, the market should do this. We've got these cycles bottoming. We've got this Fibonacci projection. We've got this Elliott Waves thing. I'm not trying to mock these ideas, but in all honesty, I've never seen a trader that used any of that stuff that could prove to me that they'd ever made any money. And I challenge people to prove it to me all the time. I will show people my account statements. I have done triple digit returns every year for the last three years using very conservative strategies. How did I do that? I followed trends. I was not using fundamentals. I was not using most technical analysis. I was simply buying markets that were going up and I was selling markets that are going down. I know that sounds simplistic, but believe me, if you do it, you will reap the benefit of let, it. Let me let me let me jump back a little because I want to. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to figure out. I, I'm always trying to figure this out on my own too. But 
imagine, so here we are, we're talking about fundamental analysis. We're talking about technical mm -hmm. analysis. We're talking about trend following. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's hard for you and I because it, it, it still presupposes a certain baseline information. But I, I imagine for the average person where they kind of, they say, well, I'm going to trade corn. And your, your first thought was, well, dang, I don't know anything about corn. How can I trade corn? Like, meaning I need to know, like people are just going to, even bright people are going to naturally say, well, I guess I got to figure out about the weather. I got I to gotta know something about, uh, you know, f uh, crop reports or, or this or that. And w whereas with trend following, you literally walk into the room and if you just imagine a big screen on, on the wall and there's just a, a price moving up and down. And if that's the only thing you could see or the only thing that you could know, could you could you trade that video game price on the wall that didn't have any of the connections to market information or or market uh, descriptions? Meaning it was just a it's like, it an old Atari video game from 1976 <laughs> bouncing on the screen like Pong. You know, it's Pong <laughs> on the screen. Can you trade Pong? Isn't yeah. that essentially what you're doing? You're trading Pong. If you. <laughs> you, you anticipated what I was going to say. I actually cover what the names of the markets are on Windows, so I don't even know what I'm watching, if you will. And what I look at is the change for the day. That's all I look at. And if I see something that is it's moving enough, then I will remove what's blocking the actual commodity symbol. Uh, for example, my, the top thing I have right just, now. Just is, for curiosity, yeah. you do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do that because I mean, I essentially I do know what these things are because I know what the prices are. Yeah. But believe me, if you want to be successful in this, uh, and I know a lot of skeptics will say what's well, impossible. You've got to know something about everything to make money. I've literally drained my brain of any preconceptions of any knowledge. I know everything there is to know about these markets. I, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I was trained by the best fundamentalist that I ever knew in my life who worked for Clayton Brokerage. His name was Dave Brown. Dave was a genius. He knew everything. He had a photographic memory for fundamentals. He could tell you everything, supply demand estimates, etc. He knew everything, the carryover, the bushels, the blah, 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 blah. He couldn't make a dime trading because he simply knew too much, absolutely knew too much all the time. And uh, I learned a lot from not doing what Dave did, and that is play it like a video game People are skeptical of this. We can say that this is what works. But if anybody wants to come to my office in Las Vegas and sit with me and see what I'm talking about, it works. It absolutely works. And, and, and I was not a successful trader until I started trading this essentially as a video game. And, and, and people will just, I know they will scoff at this, but it, because I run into opposition all the time, uh, but that's essentially what I do. My, Michael, you, you mentioned, it just reminded me of this now when you're talking about your, uh, your uh, associate Dave, but I, and I've used this quote in, I think, it, I think two of my books, I used it, uh, um, where you told a story that you had told me years ago about a right. friend that worked for a wire service yeah. and you couldn't figure out how he came up with his analysis at the end of the day. Can you kind of relay that story? I think that was really, uh, really interesting, fun story. Yeah, I was a, a broker, uh, actually a CTA at the same time, but I was working for a firm that primarily sold precious metals. They're, they're still in business. And they hired a guy that was supposedly the fundamentalist fundamentalist uh, who knew everything there was to know about every single commodity. And he specialized in some of the world commodities like sugar and, and cocoa and coffee and that kind of thing. And so he wrote this absolutely incredible piece about how bullish sugar was you know there was this deficit there was going to be this increase in demand you know the crop the crop was going to be less all this beautiful stuff i mean you just literally wanted to just give all your money uh put all your money into sugar it was had to go up it just had to and i said to this guy i said gary i said gary how did you know all of this stuff and he just looked at me and he kind of shook his head and he said i made it up and what, I, what was your, what was your, no, seriously, what, in your deep, your, your gut of your guts, what did you feel at that moment? I mean, what was it just kind of like, I mean, what did you feel? I, in all honesty, I suspected that had always been true, but I didn't know anybody that ever wrote that research reports, if you will. And they kind of, he actually affirmed for me what I had 
and I thought w- was going on behind the scenes that the wizard, there was a wizard there, you know, he had the levers and stuff and it was all smoke and mirrors. So every time I look at something fundamental, I always go back and remember the story of Gary Miller who told me I made it up. I have to tell you, I was inspired by that story to develop a little habit that I'll do every couple months when I get bored or something. I will, I'll go look at some Yahoo finance articles and I'm telling you, anybody can do this little trick. Go look at a Yahoo Finance article, the kind of stuff that comes out all day long, yeah. then go to see who the author is, mm-hmm. okay? And when you go to see who the author is, I'm telling you, invariably, what you're going to find is a 24-year-old journalism major from an Ivy League school with five Twitter followers and three LinkedIn connections. I swear to God, every yeah. time, and and you and you literally go to look at their pages, and they're doing stupid stuff like, you know, I don't know, jumping in a pool or this or that, and you literally say to yourself, you've got to be kidding me, these major followers. Finance sites have got these kids that are yes. posing, and I'm not picking on them, but I mean, it's like you're, you're, it's like you're, it's pure comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, absolutely. And you know, I, I mentioned this on the website is, and this is true because I have had a lot of experience. I don't necessarily want to go into the particulars of this, but the fact is, look at what would happen if all of us were trading markets like video games. That is, if it's going up, we're buying, going long. Right. It's going down. We're selling it going short. Perhaps you don't need new services. You don't need any fundamental research. You don't need business schools anymore. You don't need all these trading courses. You don't need stock brokerage firms because look, all this could be done electronically. What do you need? Any, any, you don't need any brokers. You might need some people to manage the servers where the orders are going in. That's about it. You obviously need some programmers, but 95% of the people employed in the financial industry would find themselves unemployed because you don't need them anymore. Look, I mean, if you look at, look at my world, I mean, I, I write some books, I give some, I give some training classes, and I occasionally will have people come to me and they're like, well, what do I do once I learn it? What, do I do I do I stay in contact with you? Do you do, do what do we have to keep doing over time? And I'm like, no, dude. Look, my model is really simple. I'm gonna I'm gonna teach you something that I learned. Hopefully, I'm giving you a head start. I'm asking you to pay me some compensation for the head start that I'm giving you. That's it. I we we can stay friends. We can communicate, but there's no ongoing thing that I can tell you once right. you know what I know. It's mm-hmm. that's it. Well, I, I have the same thing. I, I was providing mentoring, which I no longer do, frankly, because of time constraints. But uh, I decided about three years ago to, to offer mentoring, and I I actually mentored 15 people. Now, these people were pretty good traders, I would say, based on what they told me. Of course, I, I couldn't really verify if they were or they weren't, but I, I trusted them that they would tell me that. And they, most of them were subscribers to one or more of my publications as well. But part of my mentoring was to... uh you know, provide them with two mechanical trading systems that were quite profitable. And, uh, of course, you have to follow it as like anything else. But uh, these people uh, became very, very good traders. They became very good traders. And like you, I basically just said, hey, we're, we're done. Uh, I've given you what I think you need to have. And occasionally they will come back to me. And I just had a, a, a ironically, a email from a guy that was one of my mentoring students that said, Oh my God, I, I violated the system. And, and I says, well, give me some specifics. And I guess he'd had a, a big winning position. Now, he trades primarily stocks and uh, the system said to get out. Well, he didn't, he stayed in and what was apparently a very large profit because this guy trades pretty big became a very big loss and he was essentially crying on my sh- shoulder. But as a mentor and basically a market psychologist, I said to him, you know, what's going on for you? I said, are you looking for sympathy from a loved one? He says, well, how did you know I just got married? And I said, have you been crying on her shoulder? He says, yes, absolutely. And I said, well, then you got a problem. Because you're now starting to act out, if you will. I don't want to get too psychological here, but, but I see it all the time. And what I, the importance of being disciplined and the importance of trend following is it keeps you on the right path. And if you have psychological baggage that's going to help you in a self destruct kind of a scenario, uh, it, that will go away. If you adhere to the program. So basically, I got people back on the rails, so to speak. Uh, and like you, you 
you give them the tools and then they can fish for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And, and, and so I agree with you completely that, that I, I think these kinds of conversations, though, I think the one thing that, that people like myself, yourself, some of the interviews that I've had, we all enjoy kind of, I, I think, and this is hard for sometimes new traders to understand because they're all fixated on the system, you mm -hmm. know, but the reality is once you have the system, the most important aspect to continually maintain, focus on, think about is the six inches between the ears. Absolutely. Uh, to me, I know this sounds uh, maybe outrageous, but I believe trading is almost all psychological. And that is not to say that you you obviously need a good, a good method. And, and see, one of the reasons that trend following works and it is it does work i mean it can be proven empirically these aren't just assertions by money managers that trend following works the, the records are public i mean they're audited i mean they're real it absolutely works i mean somebody wants to look at my account statements they can i mean i don't have a problem with that trend following absolutely works but what it does is it keeps you from having that big loss that can absolutely decimate an account that's what the, the systems of trend following do but beyond that again 95 percent psychological you have got to follow the system and, and i've i had a drawdown myself here just recently and this ironically in options uh of about 30 percent well for me that's huge because i use very very conservative option writing strategies but but what happens is if all the markets are moving together and there's something they're correlated there's nothing you can do and I have a huge cash reserve in my options trading and I take very little risk, but I still had a 30% drawdown. And I will admit to you that I sat here one morning and said, wait a minute, what if something's changing? What if all this stuff that I, I know is wrong? You know, I'm, I'm doing kind of a, a soul searching here. Uh, philosophers call it epistemology, uh, knowledge. How do you know something? I'm saying, what if something's changed? What if this is, you know, this is the crash? What if I'm absolutely wrong about this stuff? And then I just stepped back and I covered the screens up and I, I looked and I said, I know what got me here. I know what made me successful. I'm going to follow the system. And that's the way it's going to be. Yes. what? Well, that was the absolute low equity day for me. And I'm back to having all, I actually just made all time equity highs today as far as my own personal trading. I'm not bright. Michael, I'm just Michael, telling Michael, as you, as you know, the VIX is an extremely uh, low number right now. The VIX right. is saying everything is perfect. There is no need to worry about some of these uh, strategies like trend following trading. Just mm -hmm. trust the system. There's a guy at the Federal Reserve to take care of you. Everything uh -huh. is going to be okay. Just hold on. Hang on. VIX is low. We've got it all taken care of. You and your trend following strategies, you guys can just go jump in a lake. Um, I'll tell you, well, this kind of deviates a little bit from trend following, but it doesn't. 80% of what I do is trend following, but 20% of what I do is looking at areas where trends are liable to reverse. And ha well, those things are proprietary, but there's some really basic tools. Uh, about two years ago, I actually developed an indicator that is within, usually within 10% of the, uh, ultimate price of a market that will predict, and I don't like that word, but whether we're seeing a, a top or a bottom. And I get all kinds of flashy lights. Now, one of the reasons for this is not so much to try to fade the trend because that's going against trend following, but to anticipate a potential trend change, which means make sure my stops are there all the time. Make sure everything is kosher. Make sure I haven't made mistakes with orders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And right now, I've got so many red lights flashing on my screen that it's actually frightening, and especially in the stuff that I'm long, which is the grains, uh, the S&P, uh, crude oil, all the markets that have been moving up. Why am I long? Because they went up. So I'm long. However, there are all kinds of flashing lights. So the VIX may be low. That doesn't mean that we are not at the, the doorstep of some major trend changes. I just so, trust Bernanke. VIX is low. I trust Bernanke. 
Um, <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> he's my, I, he's my stepfather. Leave, yeah, leave him you, alone. <laughs> you, 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 let me see if I don't want to get too personal here, but, but I will say that an economist is often defined as an accountant, but who doesn't have the same personality or as good a personality as an accountant. So I'm not real convinced that, uh, economists are really good market traders or anything that you should emulate. There were a few rich economists uh, that traded markets, but a lot of them were really big failures as well. So I'm not a real believer in that the Federal Reserve has solved all of our problems. Uh, not, not at all. So let me let me let me flip you into something. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. get a little back here uh, and I'll let you kind of explain a big picture issue. So I'm sure people out there have heard the heard the expression. I've talked about it in my books, talked about it online. The efficient market hypothesis. Can you mm -hmm. define it for me? Mm -hmm. And can we talk about some of the the, the yes. negatives as to believing in this uh, notion? Well, the first thing I would recommend is a uh, a, a book by uh, or a, an article by George Reisman, R E I S M A N, and it's called Platonic Competition. I refer to that actually on my website, and uh, it, it can be found. It's in his book on capitalism, and I believe it's also free online. So just do a Google search for George Reisman, and uh, it's called Platonic Competition. Essentially, what he shows is if we had pure competition, what would happen? And the, the whole scenario, and, and it's pretty comp – I mean, it's not complicated, but you have to read it to, to, to get it. But what he did was he actually took – the efficient market hypothesis and showed how absurd it is because it presupposes perfect competition. Uh, the one of the founders of the Chicago School of Economics, his name was Frank H. Knight, uh, K-N-I-G-H-T. He was actually the intellectual fountainhead of Eugene Pharma, who was the original uh, theorist, in my opinion, of the efficient market hypothesis. Essentially, it argues that everything that is known about markets is known. There's no way you can beat the market. Buy and hold is always the best strategy because you simply cannot beat the market. You cannot ever have outsized returns. And if you do, it's based on luck. Um, it's just way out on the tail somewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look at the public record of, of trend following traders. Well, but why, why do you, do, why do you think though that, that they, have ignored the very thing that you're just saying, the public record of trend following traders. And you could go back to Donchian's time to probably see those audited right. records. Why do you think the Chicago school guys, many of them have ignored that? Uh, it would, anybody that knows how academia works knows that the worst thing you can do is, uh, is gore their ox, their intellectual ox. Look at what they have to lose. If it turns out that all of the business school professors that came out of there, and of course from other schools, it's not just them that teach efficient market. They all do. Uh, they realize that what they've advocated their whole life, their lives is flawed. It's fallacious. They, they have to, they have to recant. They have to admit it, it's failed. And, and I believe that's one of the real impediments, Michael, for anybody to admit that what you and I do works. Uh, there's, there's a vested interest. They're financially, they're tied into it. Intellectually, they're tied into it. Emotionally, they're tied into it. To me, that's the major reason that nothing ever changes. Okay, but they're bright. They're bright people. All these various professors across the university spectrum. They're bright people. Uh, at some stage of the game, uh, people like you and I that are trying to analyze this this academia world, we've got two choices. We can say they either know it or they don't know it. And let's assume let's assume they're bright people. So ultimately, they have done the homework that you and I have done, and they've chosen. They've chosen to ignore the empirical data that mm -hmm. you and I look at, that you and I help others to, to use. They've chosen to ignore that. So what does that say about the system? Well, I wanted to keep this on a positive a positive note, but well, I you have can a, say, say it happily. <laughs> well, I, I have a very low opinion of, of academia and the whole financial uh, establishment. They're working hand in hand, in my opinion, to rid people of their money, uh, either directly or indirectly, and they do a real good job of it. The reality is, Michael, very few people show trading profits year after year. Uh, the only subgroup that I know that does are trend followers. Uh, there are some people out there that have consistent returns, but we actually don't know what they're trading with. And 
people will point to certain, I'm not going to give names here, but they will point to certain people. Well, let's just use Warren Buffett and claim that what he does is he buys undervalued companies and waits till they get overvalued and then he dumps them. But how do you know that he isn't looking at price charts? Remember, they've had price charts going back way back. Yeah. How do you know that he isn't just buying companies that look really good on a chart? That is, they bought them and they start to rally. How do we know that he isn't doing that? And uh, the importance of this is you still need a trend to make a profit. And this is one of the things that I've pointed out many, many times. Look, even if you're a day trader all right, and you're trading the S&P, if you buy the S&P at 1400 and it goes up to 1402 and you take your profit, on a mini, let's say it's a hundred dollar profit. You still had to have a move from a, from 1400 to 1402 to make the profit. Well, what was happening? The market was trending, at least for that point in time. So st even people who deny the efficacy, the effectiveness, the truth of trend following are involved in a contradiction because any profit that anybody makes presupposes the existence of a trend. Even if you're using astrology, even if you're throwing darts at a, uh, a dartboard, it still presupposes that there's a trend. The trend is the basis of all profit. So from a logical standpoint, for people to deny the efficacy of trend following is a massive contradiction. You know, you make an interesting point about Buffett. And there is a very successful trader out of, uh, I believe, New Jersey these days who's running a hedge fund that has over $100 billion in assets. And uh, he... I like the way he thinks. I like all his writings that come out. Mm -hmm. But then when he starts to describe his trading, he says that it's 100% systematic, but 100% non-technical, trading over 100 markets. Hmm. And now, who is it for me, for Mike Covell, to offer criticism of a man who has had one of the fantastic tra track records of all time, who has made himself billions and billions of dollars? I'm just pointing out that... To me, you don't know the full story. Whereas, and I'll just share this with you when I got started. And in fact, I, I remember you emailing me probably in the late 90s when we first started emailing. But when I first got started, I didn't have any connections to anybody. All, mm -hmm. I, all I had was, wow, look at these interesting track records from multiple trend following traders. Look at their correlation of return, their performance correlation. And look at what's happening in, this, in the markets during the certain months when they've had the correlated performance. And I also had from, I'd say about 50% of them were always dead on honest about what they were doing. I almost like to say some trend followers like to hide in plain sight. People think there's a secret. If you actually look at the words of about 50% of trend following traders, they are telling you exactly what they're doing at all points in time. They're not lying about it. So I had, I, I was able to kind of instinctively see that about half of this population we're telling you dead on what they're doing. Then you've got their track records. Then you've got the public markets to look at it. So unlike with your example with Warren Buffett or my example with, let us I'm not trying to disguise, with Ray Dalio, unlike right. those two examples, with, with my, my early research, I was able to kind of go ahead and say, oh, well, well the puzzle fits together. The puzzle fits together. And it, it wasn't like I didn't have the luxury of sitting down with you or uh, other traders before I had that light bulb moment on my own. And then I was able to get the all the other people in the industry that helped to kind of mentor, add to. But it was my original light bulb moment by myself where I was like, well, gosh, here it is. It's in plain view. Right. Actually, ironically, Ray Dalio was interested in my technical work. When my partner and I opened a firm called Econometric Market Research in Irvine, California in about 1984, uh, I called Ray Dalio and spoke with him. In fact, we had many conversations. He was very interested in my technical work. Uh, it was not what it is now. I'm not going to say it was. And probably if he'd taken it, probably would have lost money with it, if the truth be told. But I think Dalio, like everyone is not going to not look at a chart if you just have to. I mean, they can say that they're not, they're systematic, but it's not technical. It depends how you define technical. I'm not even sure I define what I do as technical. Uh, to me, it's... Fair, fair, that's a fair point. I think that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that if something's going up, I go long. If something goes down, I go short. Yeah. And, and it's really hard for people to get that because you got to say, well, you know, why is it doing it? I'm looking, just to give you some examples here. Soybean oil right now. Well, I just read something from a fundamentalist last night that said, this stuff's dead in the water. Soybean oil is bearish. They don't care if soybeans go up another $2 a bushel. It's not going to go up. It can't go up. They got too much competition. They got the palm oil from blah, 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 right? 
This, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's got one of the biggest up moves that it's had in maybe years. And it, it's just so typical if you listen to these outside sources, if you look at fundamentals, if you get influenced by news, if you get influenced by opinions, if you get influenced by other traders, Michael, you will lose money. I, I strictly forbid, and I have some traders that work for me that just put my trades in. They are absolutely prohibited from ever giving me an opinion about anything. And, and we do everything electronically, so I never have to speak to a broker or floor broker. Somebody says, oh, it's great to talk to a floor broker. I couldn't disagree more. Uh, I make more money than most floor brokers make. It's that simple. They're there because they're taking a spread. They're making a commission, et cetera. I'm not doing that. I don't want to hear anybody's opinion. I don't care what they think. What I'm doing here is simply following my system 100% of the time. And, and, and that's what I really want to give to people is get that whatever you do, you better be disciplined. And, and if Ray Dalio is making, you know, this great money without any kind of, uh, tread following possibility, then more power to him. But you and I both know that from a statistical standpoint, there can be, uh, great deviations from the mean, so to speak. And, Per, perhaps success in the past doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee success in the future. I do know this: if markets trend, I will make money. Let me let me add something too, because I know you 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 were you're like a lot of folks I know. You're very uh, uh, you, you were expressing that you don't want to know opinions and whatnot like that. I'm sure somebody listening could be like, "Well, God, that that guy Covell and that guy, uh, you know, uh, Gibbons, they're pretty opinionated characters." And I I think what I want people to realize is that. It's one thing to have a certain life view, a certain grounded political, a certain grounded political societal view, the right way to do things, the right and way wrong way to do things. However, what what the distinction that Michael and I are drawing is that, you know, when it comes to the trading, what is is the opinions are not necessary. That doesn't uh, you know, the opinion doesn't make the uh, the price trigger your signal it doesn't add an extra piece of pie to the signal so to speak it doesn't become more flavorful to add you know because i get these i get people that come to me they're like well you know i've got this great price trace price based trend system and you know i want to add fundamentals to it to make it better oh god <laughs> yeah I, I've, I've heard i've heard that one before too well i've had people tell me well you got to give me a reason to take the trade other than the fact that the market is trending it, it's you know he, let me get Go back to something here that's so basic for me. Um, when I go in and start trading in the morning, I say to myself, it's like a mantra. I just say it over and over and over until it gets very redundant. Today is about total surrender to the market. A is A. Right? Total surrender to the market. A is A. I say it over and over and over and over. What does that mean? It means that I've divorced myself from anything other than what the markets are doing. And I can separate my ideology. I have very strong beliefs. Uh, you know, I, I do. No, and come I, on. No, that's uh, not true. That's uh, not you true. don't want to know them either because I'm getting more radical every day. I read some stuff today that's just about my hair standing on end. Anyway, I'll give you, I'll send it to you too, by the way. Anyway, uh, but from a trading standpoint, you have to be surrender to the market and you know very few people can do this i know you and i are, are performing a service for people we are trying to teach them the importance of discipline the importance of trend following but the reality is there's only a certain group of people in my opinion that are able to benefit from this it's unfortunate but that's been my experience in dealing with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients and associates uh, for the last 52 years since i've been doing this there's just some people that are not going to be successful because they can't conquer their ego. Ego is a killer in this game. And if you ever ask a guy that's gone bust, he will tell you a, without question, he violated his system. What does that mean? It means the ego did a number on him. He let his ego override what he should have been doing. I know of many, many cases, I'm sure you do too, of even trend followers who went bust. But why did they go bust? It isn't that trend following failed all of a sudden. No, it's that the trader failed. So it's very, very critical that people out there, uh, your audience, know that, and I know this is, 
I've said this several times in different ways today, but this is the essence of it. You have to leave your ego at the door if you're going to be a good trader. And, and, and you might think you can do better if you know the fundamentals. Uh, you can't. Uh, let, I, let me, I, I know the fundamentals. Let me, but, let me but, bring something else up, too, because you brought up the ego. I wish I had a note here. I was going to address that. You're addressing that. I think one of the phrases that you've used, too, is you've talked about gurus. And I want to use an example out there. And I, I don't really mm -hmm. care to name any names. Right. People can go figure things out. But, you know, obviously, part of my claim to fame uh, is 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 getting a very good uh, synopsis, a very good understanding and teaching to other people. Uh, the complete turtle story, so to speak. And for, for those people that are not aware of it, you can you can go read about the turtle trader story. But essentially, a group of novices taught to be trend following traders. And this was about 25 years ago, and about half dozen of them still trade today. So a great nurture versus nature story, a great trend following story, essentially. Well, what, the reason I want to bring, I'm bringing it up right now is not necessarily to talk the turtle story, but one of the, 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 the trainees, one of the quote turtle traders today, as far as I can tell, doesn't trade except when markets in the last two or three years or when the news starts to get to be a little volatile or the fear is really out there, this particular ex turtle has taken to Twitter and blogs and has pronounced on multiple occasions, three or four occasions, these kind of like, sell everything, tell your grandfather, sell everything, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And so literally out of the blue just come these 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 sell pronouncements. There's no other uh, strategy that you can follow. There's no other uh, consistent buy-sell regimen. There's nothing except these unexpected two or three sell everything, the world's ending, I know uh, things. And and I, the reason I bring it up is because I, I, I think I'm not trying to be a guru. I don't think Michael's trying to be a guru. I think we're, we're like a lot of people I know, we're, we're into this subject, we're teaching other people, we're showing other people, but it's not about, and I think, Michael, you'd say this, it's not about like, follow me, I'm mm -hmm. Michael Gibbons. It's no, it's like, hey, my name is Michael Gibbons. I can teach you this. You can you can learn from this. Um, you can you can share with this. You can you could be a student, but it's not this. I'm trying to get at the whole guru thing. I think the guru thing is a very destructive thing and people seemingly love heroes. They want these heroes to worship, these these crazy mm -hmm. guru guys. I mean, it's right. a long spiel, but you could probably run with it on a well, I, you know, one of the best things I, I've ever read about that was, uh, a, a f ex famous guru saying that these people, they just want to plug, they want the umbilical cord and they just want to plug in. I mean, basically. And I say on the site, there are no gurus. Look, think of Joseph Granville, the great Joe Granville. I mean, he's in the dustbin of history. He still publishes, but you know, who, who cares? Nobody listens. I don't want to, you know, be necessarily specific, but remember Elaine Garzarelli back in the eighties? She was like God. She Everybody made the, she made the 87 her. call, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody, they, every, every word that came out of her mouth was like, Oh my God. I, I haven't heard about Elaine in years. And, and people who rely on gurus, they're re they're substituting their own good judgment for someone else's. The last thing I ever want any of my my clients to do. Why do people? To, why do people do that, Michael? Why do they do it? it? Why do they do it? Why do they do it? Um, what's what's the, what's the Doctor Phil emotional need they're trying to fill by not deciding on their own and and, and just well, trusting somebody? Su substituting their you know someone else's judgment for theirs to reinforce perhaps a lack of self esteem, a lack of self confidence in their own position. Plus, they can blame the guru. I mean, let's let's be honest. If the guru says, "Hey, gold's going to you know drop to thousand dollars an ounce," and you go short and you lose a lot of money, then hey, it wasn't my idea; it was the guru's idea. Right. And I've seen that. I've seen that in people. Uh, when I find out that any of my clients are looking for me at me to be a guru, we get that straightened out right away because I don't want people doing what I say because I say it's going to do it. Uh, they need to do the right thing in trading, and the right thing is to follow trends, not necessarily what I say. And you know, I, I try to be very consistent. I mean, if I if I have a buy in something, I mean, it's a buy. It's that simple. They're either free to take it or not. 
Uh, I don't offer advice. I'm not a commodity trading advisor anymore. But what I do have is a model account that actually trades real time. I have all the trades, all the confirmations, and people are free to follow what the model account does or not. And no one's trying to be a guru. But I will tell you, if markets go up, they can see that I will buy or write puts below the market, for example. Or if the market's going down, I will either be short futures or I will write calls above the market. Those are the strategies that I use. And uh, so the whole guru thing, we have to be very careful of that you that no one thinks either you or I is a guru because actually we're not. Let me let me let me end on something. I want to end on something where I, and you'll have to follow me here. I, I mm-hmm. So we know based on I'd almost say the starting point. And somebody else could argue another starting point. Sometimes people will argue with me. It's when we left the gold standard. But for me, I would say either when Netscape went public the summer of 1995 Mm -hmm. or when long-term capital management went belly up in August of 98, that to some degree we're paying for those sins because what's been happening over the last dozen or so years is those two particular events uh, caused such such massive bubbles, and bubbles are not unique to this point in history. We've had bubbles for a long time, but they right. caused such massive bubbles. And it wasn't necessarily that the bubbles were the problem. It was the reaction to the bubbles and and primarily the reaction being monetary policy from the Fed, basically uh, the 03 uh, monetary policy and then the policy that started after the 08 crash. Uh, that we, you know, currently are sitting at the bowl, the trough, waiting for the next form of policy. Right. The reason I bring all this up, though, is. And, and you see the VIX at all time or, or very, very low. And uh, I'm trying to paint a picture that uh, of, of why, why it makes sense or why you need trend following in the face of the landscape that I just outlined. I would say that you don't, that no one knows the future and, and only the market does. So if things change radically, for example, Let's let's just say that, you know, they, un, God forbid, unleash bioterror uh, in the U.S. Or, or anywhere. I mean, it could like smallpox, for example, or, or anthrax. I mean, the markets will collapse. There's no question about it. I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, I'm omniscient that I know. But I tell you, they will. People, because of uncertainty, will simply just liquidate their positions. The mere fact that they do that will cause a, a tremendous downdraft in prices. I don't think any rational person, uh, any trend follower w- would deny that. But look. It will be reflected in the price. It will be reflected in the price. I have trailing stops right now that are we're nudging the bottom of these grain markets very close to stopping me out. But it, it close didn't happen. I'm still long the market. Point is, you need te- you need trend following to keep the now situation in in your mind at all times price is reality remember that price is reality price is what's happening now uh these things may all come to pass all these negative things about the future but the markets will tell us when that starts to happen and if in fact this is a major top in the stock market which uh some people would say you know you do the opposite of the vix if vix is high uh it's a good time to buy if vix is low uh you know etc but the reality is the market's thing, everything's good. And so far, it looks good. But if it isn't good, how do we know it isn't good? This is a more basic question. Well, the S&P will start to drop. Has the S&P started to drop yet? No, but my stop is below the market. I'm not going to tell anybody where it is, but it's there. And if the market reverses and some of these things happen, like bioterror or whatever, any kind of a fundamental thing, they blow up in the Middle East. Who knows? F- technical analysis or more specifically trend following will give us an ejection point. I, every, look, you could talk to any of your, your guys that you know that you're intimate with, uh, the big trend followers. They will tell you, yeah, we got trailing stops under all these positions. Look, they got the same positions on I have. Why? Because we're correlated. We are following trends so if the markets change trends and i hope i'm answering your question is we will know it the market's going to tell us we don't have to guess and listen to me i'm not going to pick tops or bottoms in this stuff no Uh, you're definitely answering and i guess what i and i should clarify too is that not only is there the benefit in trend following trading that you are uh that you can make money up or down i guess what i was trying to outline too is there's also the benefit 
that when the unexpected happens, the black swan happens, mm -hmm. that trend mm -hmm. following is typically on the right side oh, of absolutely. whatever direction the chaos is going. Well, I, I mean, anybody that wants to see my actual trading system, at least a, a, a chart of it, because I will tell you what what's you know what the indicators are. But I mean, as far as the bar charts and and, and the lines that I use to, to to get in and out of trades, I would be happy to get any anybody any of your listeners to show them what happened in 2007 and 2008 when the stock market started to collapse because uh, there was a drown draft then a rally and another collapse uh i was short uh, anybody's trend following system unless you're using 400 day moving averages uh was short i mean there's no question i always hear this oh well you didn't catch this drop well of course you caught the drop because any significant market move you will in fact catch it that's what trend following is by definition, uh, it's so obvious to me, but it's not as always as obvious to others. You, you, you cannot miss a move by definition if you're a trend follower, Michael, nor can you stay on the opposite side of a trending market for long if you're a trend follower. This is the key to successful trading. Michael, we're gonna, I'm going to have to wrap. I want to let people know where they can find you. They can go to gibbonstrading.com, G-I-B-B-O-N-S, trading.com right um i i you know i i definitely uh uh sh trying to you know if, if you're if you're a crazy person you know i i can't imagine it be a good friendship but if you're a, a rational person and you're looking to you're looking to possibly <laughs> looking to possibly have a nice new market contact michael's a pretty pretty nice guy uh i'll have to definitely i think i'm gonna be over in in vegas here in october so hopefully we'll catch up well I owe you a lunch too because I was wrong on the on the Yankees game. So uh, anyway, don't forget that. And that, hey, that we'll, we'll, sa we'll save that for our, we'll save that for our next conversation. Is that Michael actually has a very statistical way that he looks at the uh, the sports world too? We'll save that for an entirely different conversation. But anyways, once again, you can find Michael at GibbonsTrading.com. Michael, thank you for the time today. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Well, thank you for for honoring me. And uh, you know, you're doing really good work. And I've told you that before. You're you're putting something out there that actually no one else has ever done and probably won't do it after you. And, and because of that, I'm, I'm one of your biggest fans. Well, I appreciate it, sir. We'll, we'll talk soon and uh, lunch in Vegas. All right. Thank you, sir. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.